there's one final topic I want to talk about in this lecture, which is closely related to the canonical ensemble and the canonical partition function, and this is known as the Helmholtz free energy. So I'll just define what this is, explain why it's important, and then that will be the end of this lecture today. So let me define what it is straight away. Given some entropy function S, which depends upon the energy U and some other system properties X, we define a new function which we call f, which depends upon t and x, and also the energy u. So I'll write it with the final dependence with the semicolon, and you'll see the reason why later. Okay. And I define this as being equal to energy u minus t times the entropy. So for now, you should consider that t and u are completely independent. So that T is just a parameter, and U, the energy of the system, is completely independent of T. So in this function, you consider it that way. Right. Why is this function interesting? Well, let's look at when is this function minimized as a function of U. F is minimized as a function of U, as a function of energy, when, well, one of the conditions for it to be a minimum is that the derivative of F with respect to U holding the other parameters X and T constant, that this thing should be equal to zero. But now the function is quite simple to differentiate with respect to u. Okay. If I differentiate this with respect to u, I just get 1. t is independent, so I get 1 minus t. And then I differentiate s with respect to u. And this thing is equal to 0. But now I can rearrange this equation quite simply to get that ds by du x to the power minus 1 is equal to t. And what's this? Well, this is the temperature of the reservoir that we imagine the system is connected to. And this is the temperature of the system, energy u. So in other words, this function f is minimized when the two systems are in thermal equilibrium. Temperature of reservoir, which we called the system number two before. And this one is the temperature of the first system. It was definition of temperature. So you see that, therefore, the function is minimized when the two systems are in thermal equilibrium. So that's one useful property of this function f. Its minimum corresponds to. Okay, it, it reaches its minimum when the two systems are in thermal equilibrium. The system is in thermal equilibrium to a reservoir at temperature t. And we can find what is this minimum value of f. Minimum value of f occurs 
when u is equal to the thermal equilibrium value, which is just simply u of t of x, which we found before. Implies the f, which now I drop the u dependence and I take f to be only its minimum value. And this is equal to u of t and x minus t times the entropy, which depends upon u, which itself is a function of t and x, and it also depends upon x. So this is the minimum value. So the minimum or and equivalently the equilibrium value. And it's this function f which is referred to as the Helmholtz free energy. And the reason it's important and the reason I introduce it is you can also use this function to find all the thermodynamic properties. So if you know this function, then you know everything about the system. So like the other things we've seen, the entropy is a function of u or h, or z is a function of t u and x, or z is a function of t of x, this f can also be used to find all thermodynamic properties. And this is why it's important. So if we can calculate this function, then we can work out everything about the system. And it turns out there's a very close relationship between the canonical partition function and the Helmholtz free energy in the thermodynamic limit. There is a very simple relationship between the two. So just to finish, I will calculate what this relationship is. Okay, so finally, let's see the relationship between these two things. So what is Z? Z, T, and X is equal to the definition sum over U of W of U times E to the minus U over KBT. That's the definition. Next, I can use the definition of entropy, namely that W is, well, okay, let me write it the other way around, conventional way. S is KB log W. So therefore, W is E to the S over KB. So this becomes the sum upon U of E to the S over KB times E to the minus U over KB. And then finally, I can use the fact that entropy depends upon u and x, like this, and I can put everything together, and I get this is equal to the e to the minus u minus k, so minus t times s, which depends upon u and x, all divided by kbt. So I've simply put the two exponentials together, taken k, b, t outside, so I have to multiply by t here, 
So I get u minus ts. And you see that this is exactly the function which I called f. Right? So this thing here in the brackets is exactly equal to the function I called f. Z of t x is sum upon u e to the minus f t x u over k b t and f is minimized when u in this formula is just equal to the thermal equilibrium value. And if f is minimized, then this implies that e to the minus f over kbt is maximized at the same point. So this gives you a relationship between z and this function f t x u. Finally, in the thermodynamic limit, we can expect, and again it turns out to be true, that in this sum, only the value of f where u is given by this is significant. So in this sum, only one term is significant, only one term is significant and it's exactly that term where u is given by the equilibrium value. in the thermodynamic limit only the maximum term in the sum over u contributes significantly to z And therefore, we expect that this sum we can just replace by its maximum value. Okay, again, I can draw this kind of symbolically as well. If we imagine that I'm drawing as a function of u, this exponential here, so here I'm drawing e to the minus f tx u over kbt, then at some point it will have quite a wide distribution, but in the thermodynamic limit, we again expect that this distribution will become sharp. And this point here is exactly the equilibrium point, because this is where f is maximum, f is minimized. Now, if this is true, so if the thermodynamic limit does look like this, and again the distribution becomes sharp, then when I take this sum, I only really have to consider a single term, which is this term here. The sum is like an integral, right? So for small systems, I have to add up all of these terms here. So I have to integrate over the whole curve. But if the system is large, if the thermodynamic limit works, then instead of doing the sum, I can just replace it by this point. 
the single value. So therefore, in the thermodynamic limit, we get that Z T and X is approximately equal to only the maximum value of the sum, which occurs at the man minimum value of F, which is exactly what I called the Helmholtz free energy. So I'd simply replace the sum by its maximum value. And now this is a very simple relationship between the two things. And it's usually written in the inverted form. So in other words, the Helmholtz free energy is equal to minus KBT times the log of the partition function. So this is a relationship between the two. It's only true in the thermodynamic limit. Okay? So the definition of F I gave before is always true. It's the definition. But this relationship between the two is only true in the thermodynamic limit. So just to finish today, I want to give you a bit of a word of warning if you try and follow this course reading textbooks. There are various different functions, okay? The functions which today are called f, t, x, and u, and then the minimum value of this function over u, which I called f, t, and x. And then finally, this function minus k, b, t times the log of the partition function In general, they are all different. Right? In general, these are three different functions. This is, this is an extra variable, so it's obviously different. These two are only the same in the thermodynamic limit. But in textbooks, they are generally quite sloppy about their naming conventions. So in textbooks, you often find all of these things simply called the Helmholtz free energy. So don't be confused by that. Any one of these three things could refer to, well, may be called Helmholtz free energy in a textbook, but they are all three distinct entities, right? In particular, these two are only the same in the thermodynamic limit. But in thermodynamics, you usually assume the thermodynamic limit, which means the distinction is not so important, but theoretically it is important. Okay, so in, in this class, I'm going to be quite precise. This function f, t, and x is the minimum value of this function, f, t, x, and u, where f, t, x, and u is defined as u minus t times the entropy u and x. The minimum value of this function I call this. In the thermodynamic limit, it's the same as this, but only in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, I want to start today by continuing looking at this Helmholtz free energy, and in particular showing how you can use this to derive things like the entropy or well, other properties of the system. So how do we use this function f to derive other thermodynamic properties? And there are two equations which are very useful. Okay. The first one says that if I differentiate F with respect to temperature T and hold the other variables constant, X, then this is just equal minus the entropy as a function of temperature and other properties. So this is the first one, which is a useful thing to know. So if you know, therefore, if you know F, you can find the entropy. And secondly, if I differentiate F with respect to any other kind of property, like volume or magnetic field, X, while holding the temperature constant, then this is the same 
as differentiating the internal energy. Okay, let me write it in two steps. This is the same as differentiating T times the entropy differentiated with respect to that thing at constant temperature, sorry, at constant U, which is also the same as differentiating U with respect to that thing at constant entropy. Okay, so I, I will prove these two things, right? The first one tells you that if you know the function f, you can calculate the entropy. And the second one tells you if you want to take derivatives, then differentiating f at constant temperature is the same as differentiating u at constant entropy. Now, this is a useful relationship because, for example, the pressure of a gas is defined as minus the derivative of energy with respect to volume, right? At constant entropy. Right? This is simply because the work done is PdV, right? So the change in U is just PdV, and then just do that. Okay? So if we want to calculate the pressure, we can do it in this way, but using this result here, we can also do it using the free energy, this is the same as dF by dV at constant temperature, sorry. So therefore we can also use the Helmholtz free energy to find the pressure. Okay, and we will do this when I talk about the ideal gas, we will calculate this function F and therefore get the pressure. So that's just kind of giving you a heads up for why this result is useful. Okay. So, first of all, I ought to prove them. So, let me prove them. The proof is just simple mathematics. I take this definition of F here, and I just differentiate, okay? So, let me write that again. F T X equals U T X minus T times S U T X. So the proof is simple. You simply differentiate and you check that you get the right result. So first of all, let's do df by dt at constant x. You can see from this equation here that you'll get three terms, right? The first is t differentiate here, and t differentiate here, and finally t differentiate here. So we'll get three terms for this. Now the first one is du by dt at constant x. The next one, if I differentiate this one, this t, simply gives me minus the entropy. And the last one is a bit tricky. If I differentiate with respect to this t, this means differentiating s with respect to u at constant x, and then differentiating u with respect to t at constant x by the chain rule, right? This is s of u of t, so I differentiate s with respect to u and multiply u with respect to t. So this final one gives me minus t times the s by du at constant x times du by dt at constant x. Okay. But you see here, this is the definition of temperature, right? This is, we stated the derivative of s with respect to u is 1 over t. If you look in your notes, you'll find this from last week or the week before. This is how we defined temperature statistically. Right? So therefore, this t and this t cancels, and all I'm left with is minus du by dt at constant x, which exactly cancels this. Right? So this term cancels with this term, and all I'm left with is s, right? which is the entropy. 
So this is simply equal to minus s and is a function of t and x ultimately. Okay, so that's the end of the proof of the first one. The second one is slightly more complicated. Okay, so the idea is the same. Here, we now differentiate with respect to x. Again, we get three terms, because there's an x here, an x here, and an x here. Okay. So, let's do it. df by dx, constant t. So the first one is this, I get du by dx, at constant t, minus t times, and then this one, again, I have to use the chain rule, so this is ds by du at constant x. It's differentiating split, and then I have to differentiate with respect to that. So that's du by dx at constant t. And then finally, this one, this gives me minus t times the derivative with respect to ds by dx at constant u. And again, this, exactly the same calculate, cancellation takes place. So this is 1 over t. Again, same as before. This is 1 over t. So this cancels that. And then du by dx here cancels du by dx there. So what you're left with is this. OK, and you can see that, therefore, I've made a mistake when I wrote it. First of all, this should be a minus here. So therefore, as I stated, we've shown that df by dx at constant t is minus t times ds by dx at constant u. So to complete the proof, I have to show that this, ds by dx at constant u, is equal to du by dx at constant s. So I have to show that the, this thing is equal to that thing. Right? So let me do this. Um, you have the function s, which is a function of u and x. Right? Now if I change s a little bit, delta s, then Okay, if I change u and x a little bit, how much does s change? By the first order Taylor expansion, the change in s is equal to the derivative of s with respect to u at constant x times the amount you change u plus the derivative of s with respect to x at constant u times the amount you change x. Okay? This is just a first order Taylor expansion. The change in s is equal to the derivative times the change in u plus the derivative times the change in x. Okay, and we know that this one is 1 over temperature, so I can write this as delta u over t plus ds by dx constant u times delta x. Okay, and, and this term here, ds by dx at constant u, is exactly what we have here. So this is why we make use of this. Right? This term is the same as that term. Okay. So if entropy is a constant, this means that delta s is equal to zero. Right? If entropy is a constant, so delta s is equal to zero, then this is equal to zero, so I can write this as delta u over t is equal to minus ds by dx constant u times delta x. Okay, so this is zero, I just take this over the other side. 
And finally, I take the limit of these things going to zero, so I take delta u delta x going to zero. In which case, delta u over delta x tends to the derivative du by dx when the entropy is constant, such that. So therefore, I get du by dx here, so this is du by dx at constant entropy, and I multiply by t, and I get this is minus t ds by dx at constant u. And this is the thing I wanted to prove, right? So this is what I've got here. And I proved it's equal to du by dx at constant entropy. So I've now succeeded in proving this, this theorem, succeeded in proving these two statements. So these two equations are very useful, and we'll use them in the following weeks, so you should remember them, okay? Remember these two. <laughs> 